listening to your podcast over the past couple of days, and I'm just so blown away by the beauty of what you're bringing to the table, uh, you know, through your ministry and what you're working on. But before I jump, I, I want everybody to hear a little bit about you. I told them we met through NRB and, you know, I'm excited and thanks to NRB for what they are doing, bringing powerful people like you to the table. But first, let's hear a little bit about your journey. You are a well, mental health expert and you're an author. So how did you get here? Well, I actually have been back and forth between writing and counseling and life coaching and all of the things, right? So when I started this journey, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be led into writing or counseling. So I applied to both mm -hmm. and I actually got responses from both, which sort of confused me. And then I went first down that direction of counseling because I felt like I was moving in that direction, mm -hmm. but I wasn't absolutely sure. And I felt like God was still calling me to write. Mm -hmm. And then eventually after I had been doing counseling in Florida for quite some time, mm -hmm. I felt like I was led to go back into doing some more writing. So mm -hmm. they actually feed into each yeah. other, believe it or not, yeah. the two things. And even though I am licensed in Florida and living in North Carolina, I'm still doing the life coaching coaching piece of that. So you live in North Carolina as well. I where, do. Where I was excited meeting? to hear that you are here. <laughs> we just moved here during the pandemic, actually. Oh, wow. And where are you in North Carolina? I'm in Moores, which is close to the Charlotte area. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, we. I have family over in the Charlotte and um, uh, Charlotte area right outside of there uh, in Monroe and we're almost by the South Carolina border. So and right behind me is Swansboro. Do you guys ever get over here to go fishing or come down to the water? I don't know where that is exactly, to be perfectly no. honest. We're by Lake Norman. So our yes. fishing and boating is mostly there because that's okay. right around the corner. Yeah. So we are about four and a half, five hours from you. And we are right by Emerald Isle. And we're right here on the um, on the ocean side, really close to it's a very touristy area. But also um, we have Camp Lejeune and our military base is here as well. And um, so you have a little bit of everything. But you guys moved here uh, during the uh, pandemic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. God told us to move and we didn't quite understand it at the time, but as we were being obedient and driving up here, my husband actually got a job on the phone on the way out of town. So it was really very, very oh. much a God move. So we're excited to see what he's got for us here. Oh, neat. So talk to me about, so I downloaded a couple things. You have so many unique things, mental health expert, book author, podcaster, you, you know, you are ministering to so different many, but I want to talk about the mental health piece here for a second, because like I mentioned to you previous, before you came on, there are so many different things that are affecting our mental health diets. And what led you to be, to go into this space? Was it one thing that really just triggered you and said, I need to talk about this, or was it across the the plane of all the different things that you've been seeing in the mental health space? Well, it's always been a part of my heart and my outreach because that's what I've been doing for so long. Mm -hmm. And I do see that during the pandemic, because people were isolated mm -hmm. and because there was so much fear mongering that was going on, mm -hmm. it really has greatly affected the mental health of all of us, but particularly so for younger people, for children and for new adults. This is a huge issue with increase in anxiety and depression and even suicide attempts among younger people, which isn't common across history for that to happen for that age group at this rate. When did you start to see it increase in the time period? Well, we didn't see it exactly because we were so isolated. You weren't seeing when it was starting. So I think it was starting as soon as we started closing all the things down and people couldn't interact. Human beings are not meant to be isolated and alone. That's why the greatest torture that they give to prisoners as a punishment in prison is solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be a punishment for prisoners. I mean, you'd think in prison, you'd want to be away from the other prisoners, but that's actually a punishment even in the prison. Mm -hmm. So we know just from that fact that that works and that is torturous to people who are normally pretty hardened 
that's not going to be good for anybody. So no. we know that God, even in creation, the one and only thing that God said was not good was when man was alone. Mm -hmm. And we are not meant to be isolated yet. Mm -hmm. Even after the pandemic happened and we started to open up again, people became comfortable with something that wasn't healthy, and that is staying isolated. People have not been gathering back together in their groups, in their churches, in their communities, in their volunteer organizations. We're seeing less engagement in retail establishments like bookstores. And I was concerned about that. And that was why I wrote Upcycled, because the hope is not only are we going to be able to heal that brokenness as we gather together in the subjects and the chapters, mm -hmm. but the crafts will give people a reason to gather. Mm -hmm. And that was what I was hoping because I was hearing retailers saying they're not seeing their customers come back. I was hearing churches saying they're not getting women's groups back together. And that is not healthy for any of us. And we especially need that in order to be able to share a the good news so that people can receive Jesus yes. and also the healing that we need as broken people after such a dark time. Yes. You know, one thing that you you touched upon, and I want to take it a little bit farther. So we had a lieutenant governor candidate on the show who's running for the great state of North Carolina. And he said, and I asked him, I said, what do we do from this great state if, again, another COVID decides to rear its ugly head and come around? And he talked about the self-sufficiency of people, but he did say one thing that really struck a chord with me. I saw it, but I didn't express it the way he did. And that's, this is what he said. I paraphrased. He basically said, you know, COVID was very um, uh, discriminatory. You were able to go to your local uh, stores to get your beverages and your alcohol beverages, but yet the churches had to remain closed. And you know, I sat there and thought I thought about that. I love the fact that there were so many pastors in this area that stayed open. They weren't going to let that prohibit them from ministering. But it goes to the point of what you said. God, God created us not to be isolated. He created us to be together and together, get together as communities. And so I, I want to talk more about that as we are in 2023 as some of the emergency pieces have been lifted, what do you recommend for communities to not, I wouldn't use the word afraid, but to not be so used to the isolation piece and to gather back together? Because I even, I see in our community here, you know, I am always out walking and I see my neighbors out walking, but it took a hot minute for people to start to get used to doing that again, to start communicating and start waving and not being afraid to engage in conversation. And so what are your thoughts now as we are in 2023? I think it's very important that you step past your barriers of fear and insecurity. You can get very comfortable in your little hole, like in The Hobbit. Um, you're, yes. you're awfully comfortable in your little hole in the ground, Bilbo Baggins. You want to make sure that you don't stay isolated because your God adventure, mm -hmm. your story is meant to be played out with your fellowship and you're meant to be with other people that will strengthen you and empower you and help you grow. We don't grow well in isolation. So remembering your growth depends on connecting with other people who aren't just like you, that are different from you, that are going to have different strengths and different gifts, but mm -hmm. also know that you have something that you alone are designed to do and your purpose is not going to be carried out in isolation. So you won't fulfill your purpose by staying alone and knowing that the definition of courage of getting past that fear and that barrier comes from the Latin for heart. Mm -hmm. So it comes from love. So connect first with God's love before you venture out, mm -hmm. feel it, receive it for yourself and begin to look at other people through his love instead of through fear courage and love, which is the basis and the reason to have courage, is the opposite and the antidote for fear. The only thing that overcomes fear in a powerful enough way to get us through this is love. And the only love that is true enough comes from God's heart. So mm -hmm. we need to connect with that and reach out with that to connect with our neighbors, despite what we might be afraid of, because okay. there's nothing worse than the true result of being afraid. 
And that mm-hmm. is doing nothing and living as if you're dead already. Right, right. Let's talk about your book, Upcycled. Let's talk about the flip book and the template. I posted the link on the uh, social pages so our audience can go in and, and download it. But talk to me a little bit about Upcycled and the flip. I looked at some of the uh, Bible verses, but how did this come together and how have you been using this as a tool to minister? Well, it came together because I went to the Christian Product Expo and I was hearing some of the same things that I was hearing from other professionals in speaking and coaching areas and counseling areas that people were not gathering back together. And I was just praying as I was walking through my local park about how we can resolve this, how we can reach out and make a difference in this issue and also deal with the issues of people feeling so broken and dealing with so many mental health issues and feeling as though they can't do anything. And the Lord was bringing to mind all of these beautiful things that I see in the antique malls that I love to go to, where artisans will take things that are old and battered and junky, sometimes just worthless and ready for the landfill. And people will upcycle those things and make them more beautiful and purposeful than they ever were before. But that's what God does with us. No matter how broken we've been, no matter how burdened or chippy or beaten down, God will take us in our souls and in our lives and make us more beautiful and more useful and purposeful than we ever imagined. Mm -hmm. Not just better than we were before, but more than we ever dreamed we could be. Mm -hmm. Because through his power, we are going to be what we were designed to be. So that is the message in each chapter. It's meant to help people see their worth and their purpose Mm -hmm. and their potential, which is beyond what they can do in their own strength. Strength, but it's also meant to connect us with other people so that we can heal together. And each chapter also has opportunities where you can take those craft items yeah. and donate them. So you're paying it forward. We learn best when we share. Mm-hmm. And this is a deepened message when you reach out to others and share it. Plus, it extends that message to bless other people when you share it. Mm. Oh, wow. That's it's so powerful to hear you say that and to really start bringing things together. One of my favorite things I love to do is antiquing. And my husband dreads it because he knows I'm going to bring something home. <laughs> and if he's watching, he's probably he's probably shaking his head. But I sit there and say, I love antiquing because there's always a story behind that treasure. It came from somebody's home. It meant something to them, but they had to maybe get rid of it. And then I take it and say, okay, what can I, how can I make this more beautiful? And that's exactly, you know, God wants to make us more beautiful um, in so many different ways. And so I love how you are using this tool to bring people back together to share. What kind of responses have you been receiving from doing this? Has women have women's groups, Bible studies started to start to form? Have you seen more people start to gather in their homes together? What what kind of, um, you know, edifying responses have you received from it? Well, it came out in October, but I have not been able to get all the feedback from the places where the book has gone. It's been Uh still hard to to get that data in, but it is something that can be used by Bible study groups, Mm -hmm. by book clubs, by women's groups, by charitable organizations. This is a great way to bring people in as volunteers to get to know each other as a team. And it's also great for homeschoolers. Homeschooling mm-hmm. families can do this to connect with their teenage children. So these are mostly crafts you'd want to do with older children and sure. adults, but with teenagers, it's sometimes hard to get them to open up and talk. And a craft will be something that will give them a place that they can discuss things with you over, whereas they won't necessarily do that face to face when there's nothing to talk about. If you just ask them how their day went, you know what your teenager is going to yep. say. It'll be yep. always oh, fine. <laughs> you know, like they'll kind of grunt at you. And that's about all they're going to say. But if you can get them to do something with you that bonds you, because relationships are bonded through play. That's how we build our relationships. And if we're not playing together, we're not connecting. Yeah. Well, you said something about teenagers, and there's so so much truth in that. When I had mentioned, um, I had found one of my old speeches in running for state house last year. And, and one of the things I really engaged with was the constituencies, but the teenagers loved volunteering and having work to do. So it was door knocking and, you know, giving 
the um, neighbors an action plan. Here, you go out and vote or do this or do that. And when I got them together over pizza and a Coke, the floodgates just opened because they had worked really hard. They saw what their work could produce. And then they just started talking about all of these different things. You know, some I kept really close and others were, you know, more public in that sense. But I see that and I wonder now, you know, what are we doing to better help our teenagers fight these mental health things that are constantly lurking. It's like the devil is constantly lurking in these culture wars that are attacking our pre these precious minds. What are ways that we can help as parents? My husband and I are godparents. We, what are ways that we can be more in tune to that and being understanding of what's going on, but take, you know, what actions do we take to help prevent it or to help um, encourage or to help comfort when things like that happen. I think it's important to keep the lines of communication open with your teens over positive things and through play, making sure that you're having positive moments and it's not all about the chores you have to do, the homework you have to get done. Make sure you have some conversations over more lighthearted things and do more listening than you do advising as your children get older. Mm -hmm. Listening is incredible incredibly powerful and terribly underrated when it comes to parenting. They do not necessarily want to always be told what to do before they are heard. Most people, including teenagers, as they're individuating and becoming adults, they will only be taught if they feel that person really hears their heart. So that is true of a counseling client. Most of a counseling session is listening because that person wants to be heard more than anything in the whole wide world. That is the most healing thing you can ever do. It is loving to listen. And we could do that to our spouses too. Mm -hmm. That often is a thing in marriage where you want to advise your spouse and tell them what to do and tell them what's right for them. Even if you know what's best for your spouse, it is always better to listen for a little while first until they feel heard before you advise them. So that's the first and most important thing with your teens is know that they're going to feel heard before they're judged and mm -hmm. resist the urge to jump in and go, oh, I can't believe your, your fellow teenagers are going through that. I'm terrified. I need to block you from all of those people. Before you react with that emotional reaction, right. make sure you're listening and you're hearing past what they're saying in anger or what they're doing in their behavior and mm -hmm. hearing the vulnerable feeling in their heart. It sounds mm -hmm. like you're feeling disrespected. It sounds like you're feeling confused. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're feeling afraid. Look for that vulnerable feeling and connect with that. And then later after they feel heard, that's when you can give the opportunity. So can I give you some guide points mm -hmm. to help you make a decision? Because the goal with a teenager is to help them to make a good decision, right. not to tell what to do at this point. You're teaching them to become individuals. So you can guide them and say, what do you think God's word says about this? Right. Right. I'm interested in your perspective. They love to have an opportunity to think things through and you can guide them and you can say, well, for this, this particular verse might address that for you. That would be something you can use. What do you think about that? Get right. them to think Always when someone is feeling and they're confused and they're afraid, if you can get them through that after you've listened, after you've listened yeah. and get them into their thoughts and think about the facts and the truth, that would be the next thing. But do it without doing a lecture. Mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not little children that need a lecture. They're right. growing adults. They need to be guided on how to make good decisions on their own. And when they feel respected, then yeah. they're more likely to listen to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I... I love what you said about all of that because I sit there and I have so many dear friends who are amazing parents and I always applaud them on being such great parents because you can see these young adults becoming great future adults and how they, they give, how they love, how they are wanting to serve and wanting to participate and wanting to be a part of community. And then as I was also sitting there listening, you know, listening to our spouses. Let's talk about that for a second. I'm the fixer, but my also, my husband also likes to fix too. And it's interesting. We are 13 years apart. He's from the South. I'm from the North. You can't. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so 
everybody everybody loves the fact they're like how in the world i said it was all jesus i i know it <laughs> from the very tips of my toes the top of my head it was the lord but you said something very valid it is to listen it is to hear their hearts. It is to understand and where they're coming from. And yeah, we want to try and fix each other to help one another so we don't hurt or so whatever. But what are some other, as we've been married, I guess if you could still call us honeymooners. We've been married for going on, it'll be six years this year. So is that still a honeymoon? And, and we both got married for the first time. I was 40, he was 53. And hence why we adopt all these kids uh, and are, you know, there are God kids, if you will. So in that it has been so neat to be, have this amazing relationship. And we are, you know, we're not the younger version of still trying to figure out what we're going to do with the rest of our lives. We have accomplished so much in our careers. But what are some other things that you can share to the young couples, to the newly married couples, to those who've been married 46, 47 years? What are some of the just the amazing things that you can say to them if they are, you know, um, you know, what's next for us after 45 years of marriage? What else do we do now? What are our next phases? Or for my husband and I going on, it will be six years this year. What are some things that you say to couples as they grow together and and have that fruit? But what are, you know, the listing piece is one thing. What's another thing that you would say? I would say that you need to make sure that you're clear in your communication with each other. You mm -hmm. listen first. God gives us two ears and one mouth. So that's really, really important to know. Listening in love and looking for the best in the other person. Mm -hmm. And that's true with teenagers too, whether you're parenting or you're dealing with your spouse, always come with a strength-based approach. So when you're upset with each other, the one thing that you want to do is step back. Step back from that moment of conflict until your heart rate goes down. When your heart rate goes up to 70 beats per minute or higher, <laughs> your mental function runs away from the frontal lobe of your brain where you can make good decisions, where you can have all your executive functioning skills, where you can listen and process new information. It all goes away from there. You're not doing anything from that that better formed part of your brain, that better version of yourself is not coming forth. It's all back in the limbic system of your brain, that fight or flight or freeze right. part of your brain. Because you're right. seeing this just like you would if a lion was attacking you, if you're mm -hmm. in conflict with somebody. Right. So you're not thinking, you're not processing, and you're not going to present your best self. Mm -hmm. So it's best to remove yourself from that person and pray through your feelings mm -hmm. and ask God to help you filter those feelings. Mm -hmm. Which part of this is me? Which part of this is about a dysfunction in our relationship? Mm -hmm. Which part of this is something in the other person that is an issue that needs to be healed or fixed? Mm -hmm. And what part do I need to play in that? Mm -hmm. Is it my place to even address that issue? Right. Or is that something, Lord, that you plan to bring to that person's attention in another way? Mm -hmm. How do I respond to this? if at all. And you mm -hmm. let God deal with your heart because your responsibility is for your feelings to deal with them with right. God. Right. You're not responsible for fixing that person's feelings, thoughts, or behaviors, or actions. Right. None of that is your responsibility. That's overstepping your boundaries if you're trying to fix. Right. If you're trying to make them fix you, that's also not healthy boundaries. They right. are not there to make you happy. Yeah. I know that everybody thinks that, that I got married because this person is going to make me happy. Nobody can make another person happy. That is a huge myth. The romance industry, all of the novels and all the films, as much as I love my friends that do them, need to stop perpetuating that myth yeah. that people make us happy. Only between us and God and that decision to receive God's grace and love and joy in the Lord is going to make us happy. And happy is different than joy. We're not going to always be right. happy either. So knowing that and being able to accept that truth instead of that myth, then mm -hmm. we're not likely to see our relationships as always being the fluttery butterflies in the stomach. Right. That is actually a chemical reaction called phenylethylamine. All of that stuff that you see in the romance novels and the movies. Thanks, about <laughs> You know, all of those things that last for three to six months, maybe a year or so. But really what that is, is a reaction to their cologne or their perfume or their shampoo. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love it. Well, you know what? I, guess, 
I guess we have to say thanks, Hallmark, for screwing us up. <laughs> Right. <laughs> or thanks for getting us through or whatever. I don't know. You know, I was sitting there watching it. I said to, I said to my husband this weekend, I was like, there's a new Hallmark movie on this weekend. It's called the wedding cottage. You will watch it with me. Oh. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he did, he watched it with me, but with his own headlines and subtitles and everything else in between. Anyway. So that's love. That's love. Yes. That's love watching yes. Hallmark and a rom-com anyway. I want to hear about what you have coming in the next couple of months. I know you have a podcast. How often does that air? I know that you're going to be at NRB and I know that you have some other opportunities. So talk to us about what you have coming down the pike and where can my amazing audience, not just in North Carolina, but all over the place, find you, follow you, watch you, listen to you. Well, I'm going to the Well Conference for Creatives in Michigan this week, okay. and I'm leaving Wednesday to head to, up to that. And then I'll be at NRB, like you said, in May in Florida. That'll be an amazing conference. That's always a big deal. Mm -hmm. And my podcast is called Flourish Mint. Flourish, and that's dash M-E-A-N-T. So you can live the life that God meant for you and flourish. It's all in interviews with experts that are going to help you live your best life. And that is always every Friday at eight o'clock. There's a new episode that airs. If you happen to be a writer and you're looking for inspiration, I publish a weekly writer's inspirational devotional. So you can center your writing on Jesus every week. It's free. It comes out every Monday at 8 a.m. And a different writer every Monday will have a devotional for you there from that. And that's Inspirations Online. Dot com where you can find that. And you can find me for life coaching or speaking opportunities at tinayeager.com. You can also check out the podcast there or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Yeah, I absolutely love your podcast. And it is it was really very inspirational listening to the one of your worth in Christ. And I absolutely loved hearing that one because I think we need to be reminded of that. And the guest that you had on for that podcast, she really had a very powerful story of what led her to that. So I'm not going to reveal anything. I will let the audience go check out your podcast because that was one um, they must hear. And I also wanted to find out where else are you looking for additional speaking engagements? Are you looking for additional opportunities? Yes, I'm always available for speaking okay. engagements, especially local ones, um, okay. but I'm willing to travel as long as it's covered. So, um, yeah, I love doing speaking engagements because that gives me that opportunity to connect with people. And, you know, when we're writers and we're podcasters, we're in our space and yeah. it's easy to get isolated. I prefer to go out and do those events where I can just lay hands on people pray on them, you know, get really connected personally with the audience and love on them and be able to, to kind of minister to people in person. Mm -hmm. I do love that. There's a conference coming up in September, Salt and Light Conference, and it's not it's not going to be too far from where you're located, um, put on by North Carolina Faith and Freedom Coalition. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to be there with the podcast and my friends run the organization. I think that'd be a great place for you. I, I would really love that. Love yeah. 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 So definitely check them out. Um, and then also your upcycled piece, I think would be great for the Bowery mission. My friend who I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, Julie Remain, she's been on the show a couple of times talking about her work with the homeless women in New York City. And um, that's a huge ministry that I used to serve with. And I think your upcycled idea would just be great for the Bowery Mission Women's um, group. So um, I'd love for you to connect with them as well. But anyway, I, I'm just any final words. I, I would like to have you stay on, but I'm, I know we're at our time limit. But any final words of wisdom for us in this culture as Christians and for us as we pursue going back to church, as we pursue that relationship with Christ, as he's pursuing us, what are some of your words of wisdom as we go on the day-to-day -day fighting off fighting off everything that's around us, fighting off our phones. I even said to my husband while we were fishing this weekend, if I had the opportunity, I'd throw my phone in the water. So I would never have to be that, that distracted. But that's the world I live in. That's the role I play with my work. To that, where can we be mindful, have those boundaries to, to stay engaged, 
to find the rest, but also to be a part of the community and not isolate as we have been so used to doing. I think first and foremost, you need to know who you are in alignment with the heart of God yeah. and not allow the enemy to tell you what to feel, what to think and what to not do. Right. Center your heart in the courage and love of God and see, ask God, just ask him, let me borrow your lens and let me see the way you see, see yourself the way God sees you. If you need to pray through Psalm 139 to see yourself yes. with God's love, do that. Do that every day if you need to. Mm. Put on your armor against the enemy, not against people. Pray Ephesians 6 so that you protect yourself against the deceptions of the enemy that he's going to bring against you to change your attitude. So mm -hmm. it's one of fear and one of distrust and all of those things. Remember that lost people are lost people and they are still loved by God. So they're not your enemy. You right. have an enemy behind them that may be doing things that they're vulnerable to participating in. But right. stop seeing people as your enemy. Right. Pray for the people against the enemy and see them with the lens of God's love so that you don't have anything to be afraid of. We mm -hmm. don't have to fear death. We don't have anything to be afraid of as believers. Right. And if you're not a believer and you're listening to this, you can have that hope too, so that you don't need to be afraid. Just learn to recognize Jesus is your savior. Make that commitment, say that prayer and just invite him into your heart. And mm -hmm. that can change your whole entire outlook in life. So you won't need to live in fear and darkness anymore. Oh, well said and so powerful. Well, Tina Yeager, I am so honored and I cannot wait to meet you at NRG. So to it. Yeah, I'm going to be driving down and um, I cannot wait to meet you and uh, just sit down and have coffee with you. And I would just absolutely love to just um, soak in some more. I'm a sponge and I absolutely